So, hola, bonjour, ciao, guten tag, konnichiwa, hello, mahalan, namaste. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to another great talk in the series of Global Immuno Talks for 2020, 2022, where our hope is to inspire immunologists across the world in an egalitarian manner and, we, and to connect with you all. And we have a, a real treat to this week with having Rafi Ahmed be our speaker. I'm actually at the Delta Sky Club uh, giving you this this introduction as I'm on my way to, to go visit some family. But I thought this would be a great place because this is literally Rafi's second home at, at the Delta Sky Club. In fact, my one of my favorite little stories was when I was a postdoc and I was uh, just starting to travel more, going through interviews. And, you know, after having had papers out of Rafi's lab and and, you know, making some accomplishments and then going on the job market. And, and I started to accumulate more uh, frequent flyer miles. And I remember walking into Rafi's lab, even after I just be, became an assistant, accepted my assistant professorship at Yale, I came into Rafi's office and I said, hey, Rafi, guess what? I just became silver medallion on Delta. And he was like, oh, yay! Here's like the best accomplishment I'd ever done. <laughs> so uh, I've gone a little bit farther than silver now, Rafi, but uh, uh, thank you for uh, for your encouragement. <laughs> um, I want to tell you a little bit about Rafi. He grew up in Hyderabad, India, uh, and then he moved to Pocatello, Idaho, where he did his master's degree. So that was his first introduction to the U.S., who was coming into Pocatello, Idaho, and a lot of people don't know that, but he had a really great time uh, in 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 that in Idaho and, and learning about America uh, in in that in that way. He but they then went and did his PhD at Harvard in Bernie Fields' lab, and from there he went and did his postdoc in Mike Oldstone's lab at, at, at Scripps. Uh, he is now he he then started his lab at UCLA, and following that he was recruited to Emory to start the Vaccine Research Center, where he's been ever since and has made an amazing impact uh, with with his own, not only his own lab at Emory but also uh, with the Vaccine Research Center. He is now currently the Charles Howard Candler Professor at Emory. Uh, he's received numerous awards, as I know many of you know. He's a National Academy member. He's had the Robert Koch Award, the William Coley Award. He's a distinguished fellow of, of the American Association of Immunologists. And, and perhaps the most important award is his AAI Excellence in Mentoring Award, which is highly deserved because Rafi has just been an outstanding mentor for, for many generations of scientists now. Uh, what most people also know Rafi for is, of course, his just outstanding and elegant work and pioneering new concepts and frameworks for us understanding how immunological memory forms, T-cell memory, B-cell memory, T-cell exhaustion, you name it. He's, he's been a, a major, uh, 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 you know, not only pioneer, but just uh, teaching us the textbook of a lot of how, how these processes work. Um, his current uh, talk title is going to be on immunological memory to COVID. And I have one question that we like to ask our speakers, Rafi. Um, my question for you is, what's the current password for the Delta Sky Club this week? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. I have a better question. Um, what are the most important things you think the next generation of immunologists or perhaps scientists in general should be thinking of or paying more attention to? Well, that's a tough one. I thought you'd ask me an easier question. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's... It doesn't have to be the most important, a, a important. A for, yeah, yeah, but of course, there's no single B one. I think my advice would be to always address a question that's very fundamental. Address a fundamental process as opposed to be driven by the latest technology. You know? So ask the fundamental question and then use the latest technology to address the question and not, not in reverse. Yep. Great. Well, thank you. It's just an honor to have you here. So go ahead and you can start sharing your slides. All right. And I'm going to turn off my microphone. Okay. okay. Can you? Yep. It looks great. All right, can you all hear me and see my slides and my pointer? Yeah. Okay, great. All right, okay. So I'll move closer a little bit so I can uh, be closer to the microphone. 
Okay, so in my, again, I want to thank uh, Sue, Elena, Kala, all of you for this, for the invitation, and Sue, many thanks for the wonderful uh, introduction. Uh, so I'm going to start out with uh, just some general comments about immunological memory. These will be things I think everyone knows, but I think it's good to start with some very basic principles of immune memory. Um, I will then uh, describe what we've done looking at longitudinal analysis of uh, DNT cell memory in COVID-19 patients. Uh, and this really will be the, probably the bulk of the data that I'll show you. Uh, I will then get to the issue of antibody responses to SARS-CoV-2 variants in these individuals who were convalescent patients after Wuhan infection. And then I'll address a question that's of great interest at the moment, which is uh, updating the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine and how this should be updated, which variant should be included, and what really should be the immunization strategy. So some recent unpublished data from our lab on this issue uh, and some uh, discussion points that I want to raise. I will then end with a single slide about the issue of protection from infection versus protection from disease. Again, a key issue in terms of uh, uh, what really our goals are and how we uh, come up with the best strategy for preventing us uh, from SARS-CoV-2 infection. All right, so let me start with the immune memory part, the very general introduction. And here I start with uh, uh, what is my favorite natural experiment of immunological memory. I think I've, some of you might have heard this in my earlier talks, uh, but I still would like to start with this experiment of nature. Ah, okay. okay, this experiment of nature occurred almost about 200 years back uh, on the Faroe Islands. And these are, you can see from this map that they're very isolated uh, from the mainland of Europe. Uh, when this experiment of nature happened, uh, the Faroe Islands uh, uh, were actually under some embargo uh, in terms of. Uh, um, uh, traffic between the mainland and the, and the Faroe Islands. It really remained very isolated for an extended period. And, and then the restrictions on travel between Faroe Islands and the rest of the Europe was uh, eased. Uh, and that's when something very interesting happened. So I'll show you here the chronology of this. So basically, in, there was a measles epidemic on the Faroe Islands in 1781. And then no cases of measles were reported in this window from 1782 to 1825. And that again was because of the travel restrictions between uh, mainland Europe and, uh, and this very isolated uh, Faroe Island sitting in the middle of the sea. Um, and then when in 1845, people started coming in, this resulted in a year later in a major epidemic of measles where almost 95% of the population Got measles. So when this measles epidemic happened in 1846, there was a outstanding physician scientist named Peter Ludwig Paynham, uh, who at that time actually was a medical student um, in Denmark. And Paynham went to the Faroe Islands in 1846 to investigate this measles epidemic. He was, as I said, he was a young man who was 26 years old and at that time was a medical student. And he then published a remarkable paper. And just look at the bottom here. This paper was published to, in Virtue's archives in 1847. And if you haven't read this paper, I really urge you to read it. It's really a beautiful uh, um, analysis of, uh, of things that he found. And you can find this in the medical classics, uh, this volume three uh, from 1939. Okay. So this is a direct quote from the paper uh, that, um, that Payne and published. So the first observation he made was, which was an amazing observation, was that of the many aged people still living on the pharaohs who had had measles in 1781, not one was attacked the second time. So these people would have been children at that time, got, had gotten measles at this, at this earlier 1781 epidemic. Um, and none of these individuals who now were much older in their 70s and beyond, uh, 
uh, none of them was attacked the second time. And then he had a very good control group because there were still some old people there who had not gotten the measles uh, 65 years earlier or 70 years earlier. Um, and now they all went uh, infected. So essentially, this was a remarkable observation because it not only showed that there was still protective immunity in someone who got measles as a child uh, 65 years earlier, uh, but that re-exposure, this is the key point. The fact that someone gets one infection, they usually don't get it second time, was has been noted historically, going back to the time of the Greek uh, philosophers, okay, who had noted that people didn't get the plague twice. It was known that smallpox, again, you did not get it uh, twice if you had gotten it once. But what this showed was that re-exposure was not needed because there was no measles circulating on the islands for 65 years. This showed that even the absence of re-exposure and some uh, boosting, you could be protected uh, from getting uh, disease. And, and so I think that that showed that it really, the mechanism of protection were really inherent and in the body uh, immune system and did not even need any boosting. So what is the, what are the potential mechanisms? And this is again, I now move to a very uh, kind of a simple uh, set of comments and slides, uh, but just to kind of put things in context. So, so really, how do you get protective immunity to viruses and intracellular pathogens? Well, the first line of defense, as everyone knows, is pre-existing. And this is key, that at, if at the site of entry of the virus, there's sufficient antibody that will neutralize the virus, that is the best mechanism of preventing infection and also reducing disease because you limit the number of viral particles that will initiate infection. So really is the key first line. And, and then of course you have your T cells which come in and expand very quickly. Even if they don't expand, they become effector-like cells very quickly, the memory cell, and eliminate the infective cells. Very simple, but I think a correct way of looking at protection from the adaptive immune response is pre-existing antibody being the primary mechanism, and then the memory T cell response kicking in, providing help for more antibody production but more importantly, killing the virally infected cells. So how do you get such long-term persistence of antibody? So in addition to this Payne's uh, beautiful study, there was another very interesting study that was done by, I'm not, I don't have a reference for that here, but there's a study that was done in the 1930s uh, by John Seaver. And he studied a yellow fever um, outbreak, or epidemic that had happened in Norfolk, Virginia. And what he did was he collected serum from people who had recovered from this yellow fever epidemic in North of Virginia, because there were no more yellow fever after that period for this uh, 70 years or so. And uh, he then took that serum and showed that that serum by adoptive transfer could protect monkeys from the yellow fever wild type of CB strain. Yellow fever CB strain is highly pathogenic for not human really primates, with 100% mortality. But if we transferred sera from these people who had had yellow fever 75 years earlier, uh, he got almost complete protection uh, from uh, disease and from death. So how do you have antibody persisting for decades or even longer uh, following an infection? And the, and the answer for that, again, I think most of you know this, is really, this, how does this happen? And the answer is the generation of the long-lived plasma cells that reside in the bone marrow. So, so when I was at UCLA, Mark Slifka was a graduate student in my lab, and Mark made this very interesting observation that after an acute LCMD infection, uh, you can get long-lived plasma cells that reside in the bone marrow. And by doing a series of experiments, he showed that no additional input from the memory B cells is essential, and that the vast majority of these plasma cells can persist in mice for the lifespan of the mice. Andreas Radberg, uh, working in Germany around that time, uh, made very similar observation. Then this observation now have, was confirmed by many other people, including Mark Slipka, actually, from his own lab uh, in Portland, Oregon, showing that in humans also a very similar pattern is seen of very stable, long-lived uh, antibody responses many, many years after vaccination. The paper he published in Immunity Journal Medicine. 
chromosome. So this is the typical kinetics of an antibody response. After infection or vaccination, a lot of antibody comes up, but most of this, there's always a decline because most of this antibody that you immediately make is coming from the shorter lived plasma cells. And I show you a cartoon kind of show that. And most of this also is extra follicular. It's not really within germ center. So these shorter lived plasma cells will die within the first uh, few months. Uh, and then, or sometimes actually a little bit longer, they continue to decline. But then you get this very stable uh, phase where antibody will persist for very, very extended pieces. Uh, and this is coming almost exclusively from the long-lived plasma cell inside the bone marrow. Long-lived plasma cell can also be at some other sites, but the bone marrow is the major reservoir. And the, the working model is that there are um, key survival signals that these uh, uh, plasma cells get within the bone marrow niche that keeps them uh, alive for extended periods and protected. Plasma cells, as most of you know, do not divide. So this is a, this basically is the factory producing antibody. Over 50% of the protein in the plasma cell is antibody. They're just constructively secreting antibodies. There's no B cell receptor on the plasma cell because antibody is not held there, it's just secreted. Uh, so this is constitutive production of antibody from these plasma cells for extended periods. So this is just a cartoon of what I was telling you. Uh, so when a naive B cell gets activated and there's appropriate CD4 T cell health, this is key. Uh, the CD4 health part is essential to giving you these long-lived plasma cells and high affinity antibody. Uh, you get activated B cells that are interacting with CD4 uh, health. Uh, and some of these activated B cells as they divide uh, will differentiate into plasma cells. This is something that all of us study in the blood very rapidly after infection or vaccination, you can find these plasma blasts that come out. So after a primary infection and even after secondary infection or uh, recall, this early burst of plasma cells is actually mostly extra follicular, uh, but it's still CD4 dependent. The CD4 dependent extra follicular response Huge amount of antibody is secreted. That's why you get this rapid burst of antibody coming into the serum following infection or vaccination. Uh, and, um, and this is good because it is immediately providing some protection, but most of these are short-lived and they will eventually die. Uh, but then these, some of these activated B cells will go into germinal centers and you have the appropriate interaction with CD4 T cells and B cells here and here some magical things happen <laughs> where the precise mechanism still remains uh, not very clearly defined, where you will get more memory B cells, of course, because you want to keep this uh, full uh, memory B cell. You can also get somatic heart mutation here to give you higher affinity B cells. But then you get some cells from coming out from here, which are qualitatively different from the plasma cells here. They will find the appropriate niches and become long -lived. This early plasma cell also can migrate to the bone marrow. There's no defect. They have studied that Carl Davis, who's a uh, research associate instructor, two professor in my group, he showed that after flu vaccination that we get, the inactivated flu vaccine, the seasonal vaccine that we get, uh, following vaccination, uh, these plasma blasts that come up do migrate to the bone marrow. If you look uh, a month after uh, vaccination, so the study design was we take a bone marrow drop from these uh, volunteers, these brave volunteers who agreed to get bone marrow drug done multiple times. Okay. Uh, uh, in, this, in, this, in this study, you always have some, uh, everybody's sort of positive, so there are bone marrow uh, plasma cells at the time of uh, the, the vaccination, but a month later, a significant increase in the number of plasma cells in the bone marrow, but if you look a year later and same individual, most of the, of the cells which were generated by this uh, initial thing actually have ended the time. So, Many of these are too good as bone marrow, but qualitatively, qualitative differences, plus perhaps the not finding the right niche results in them not surviving. Okay, but in the, the better situations, is some of these will become longer plasma cells, and, and that's which becomes the key for providing long-term antibody response. What about uh, T cells? Again, CD4 cells, as I mentioned, critical for antibody responses, also antiviral effects, and CDA T cells are best uh, 
immune killer uh, of uh, infected cells. So this is essential for eliminating the viral infected cells. And if you look at the kinetics of this, again, a very similar thing to see in terms of the kinetics. Antibody comes up mostly from the early uh, plasma blast response. Many of those cells die. We can think of that in the context of an effector B cell response. Uh, and then you get these long plasma cells here. And again, with the same thing with CD4 and CD3 cells, there's huge expansion initially and contraction. And in some ways, this contraction is essential because this expansion is so big. Same thing with the plasma blast. Create so many plasma blasts. Uh, we don't want to become overburdened and have too many T cells and, uh, and plasma cells uh, because homeostasis of the immune system is key. So many of these will end up going up apoptosis in the next few weeks or months, and then you get the stable pool of memory cells. And again, this is a summary of work done by many, many groups. So as has as been shown that these memory T cells can persist long-term in vivo in the absence of antigen. They're capable of homeostatic proliferation, slow self-renewal mediated by IL-7, IL-15. Uh, and this is, of course, actually dependent. But then when they see antigen again, the key thing that happens is even before they divide, they almost immediately express effector function. And this, it's not so much the proliferative capacity that's different between a naive cell and a memory cell. In fact, like both are equally good. One would even argue life cell might even be better than that. But the key thing is a memory cell within hours with elaborate effector function. And that is the key difference between a naive and a memory cell. So this again becomes very effective in eliminating the viral infected cell. And this combination is what uh, gives you good effective immunity. And many people have shown in humans that for decades after an acute infection of vaccine, if it's a good vaccine, you can detect long uh, long term memory C4 C4. Okay, now let me switch to the keep a tab on the time. So this study was um, a collaboration with uh, Judy McElrath's group at the Hutch. And what we did was uh, we were fortunate to recruit a cohort, about uh, uh, 250 to 300 convalescent patients. So this recruitment was done in the early 2020. Uh, so all of these people were infected with the Wuhan or the WA1 strain. Uh, about half of the cohort is based in Atlanta, and about half of the cohort is based in Seattle. Uh, a key point about this cohort is that the vast majority of these were non hospitalized So they were people who had an infection, but it was not uh, an infection that put them in the hospital. And I like this cohort because it kind of represents what happened with the infection in the vast majority of patients uh, who got sick, uh, but were not hospitalized. Unfortunately, the infection rate was so high that we had a, a terrible burden in terms of people who were hospitalized and people who died. But the vast majority actually did not. So in this case, uh, it's kind of representing what kind of memory was there in an individual who was not uh, hospitalized and had mild to moderate uh, uh, COVID, SARS CoV 2 infection. So this is just to remind everyone, I think you've all seen this photograph. I just want to point out one thing is the coronaviruses are kind of interesting because they're really heavy. For an RNA virus, they have a huge genome. It's by far the largest RNA genome in virology uh, with almost 30 kb. Uh, most of the RNA viruses are in the 10 to 15 kb range. Some are even less, like the rhinoviruses. Uh, but this is a large, large uh, genome uh, and almost has a 8 kb uh, devoted to, to, to the polymerase, which is quite interesting. Uh, of course, the most striking feature of this uh, of of these coronaviruses is the spike protein, uh, which kind of decorates them, looks like a crown, and that's why it's called uh, the coronavirus, because it looks like a crown. And this, of course, is also the, the target for uh, neutralizing antibodies. And of course, this is the protein that's used in, in our vaccines. And just to again remind everyone, uh, this is uh, again the one of the reasons that sticks out so prominently is it's a large pro large large glycoprotein. Again, I think among the largest glycoproteins, it's uh, almost uh, uh, not almost it has 273 amino acids in length. Uh, and then this is the receptor binding domain, the RBD region, uh, which binds to the ACE2 and to receptor. Mm -hmm. Many, but not all, of the neutralizing antibodies recognize this region. 
There are some that recognize other regions too, but this is the major uh, neutralizing effort at the time. But other uh, regions are also taking part. I point that out because the idea of just using RBD uh, as a vaccine antigen has its advantages, but also some uh, concerns because you are you will be missing other regions that can generate that neutralizing effort. Okay, so this is what we did in our study. So we had this longitudinal cohort uh, and uh, of almost about 250, people, half of them here, half of them in Seattle. So we did the following analysis. Uh, we looked at binding antibody to SARS-CoV-2 spike protein longitudinally. Uh, we looked at, this This would be a little bit side bar to it, but I think I want to show this because it makes it important point that I'll get back to uh, later at the end. We also looked at the effect of SARS-CoV-2 infection on antibody titers to the common alpha and beta coronavirus. Uh, and then going back to the analysis of the SARS-CoV-2 antibody, of course, we did neutral, look at neutralizing antibody using a live neutralization assay. Uh, looked at memory B cell responses to, to SARS-CoV-2, CD4, and CD8 B cell responses. So let me start with the binding antibody data. It's a busy slide, but I'll kind of uh, walk you through it. So this is looking longitudinally going out. I'm going to just focus on this panel to make the main points because you just from this you can see uh, what we find in the, with the other columns that I have here. Okay. Uh, so basically, we were able to get multiple time points in each individual. We actually have, in some cases, seven or eight. So this this group of patients have been amazingly cooperative, and we're most thankful for them to for allowing us to collect so many samples from them. But this makes the longitudinal analysis very robust because the same individual is being followed uh, for this eight month uh, window. So what I have here is IgG antibody in the serum, IgA, IgM, reactive to the spike protein, reactive to the RBD region, or reactive to the N-terminal domain region. Let's just look at this particular one uh, to see what we find. So in this case, there are 222 patients. That those are all in blue. The red here is an important control. Uh, these are some samples that we had from studies we had done with the yellow fever vaccine or influenza vaccination in our lab. And we had longitudinal samples on them because we were following yellow fever specific response to the influenza specific response in this case. Uh, but this, these are samples pre-pandemic. So you can see that there's very little or no antibody. So this becomes our negative baseline. So then we look at the kinetics of the antibody response. So that, uh, that we did the analysis two ways. One, to look at the exponential decay, which is the black line. So if you look at the exponential decay, uh, we got a calculation of about 126 days as the half-life of this uh, antibody response. And just to remind everyone, the half-life of antibody itself is about two to four weeks. So of course, this is, that would be much faster. This is now a very different thing that we're getting because there's some cells still living and uh, producing antibodies, but some kind of the plasma cell uh, still there. Um, but if we do the analysis using this power law technique, we got a very interesting uh, result. We found that actually this slope is a little bit biphasic. That is a faster decline initially, but then a plateauing. And you can see that this plateauing is happening so if you we do the calculation starting around day 100, uh, in this case, I think it was day 100, day 120, how does this look like? The half-life now is about 230. So what this is telling us is, again, a little faster decline initially, and then a plateauing giving us a much risk. So the numbers now become much more respectable. Okay, this is not a bad half-life of uh, in terms of uh, of this analysis. So you see the same analysis or same data if it's just five, RBD or NPD, and the IGA numbers, I don't have the numbers here, but that's also similar. IGM, of course, uh, this is here, much faster. Okay, so now I'm going to digress a little bit and address the issue of the what is happening now to the antibody to the alpha and beta coronavirus. These are the endemic or the seasonal alpha and coronaviruses. Uh, there are two of them. Uh, there are two alpha coronaviruses, T29E and L63 and two uh, beta coronaviruses, HPU1 and OC43, and of course SARS-CoV-2 is a beta coronavirus. Okay. Um, now, all of these endemic seasonal coronaviruses infect children. 
So if you look in the adult population, uh, pretty much everybody is seropolymer. So pretty much all of them. We have data now in about 1,000 uh, samples from different uh, studies, and we have not found anyone who's seronegative to these uh, alpha and beta coronavirus. Again, these are usually acquired uh, during childhood. The disease is not that severe, uh, and, but everybody comes to seropolymer. Also, SARS-CoV-1 uh, is a beta coronavirus. So what I'll show you next is what do antibody responses look like to the uh, to these alpha and beta coronaviruses? And I'll start by showing you data from this pre-pandemic people. Okay, so that is there's no SARS-CoV-2 uh, yet. And that's shown over here. Okay. So this is from our pre-pandemic cohort. And uh, of course, we had these samples from much earlier, some from 2010 and some from 2015. Uh, as I told you, they're from the flu studies and yellow fever studies. And, we, and what I want to emphasize here, the remarkable stability, straight line. Actually, we cannot get a half line. So that's what I want to get back to. When I showed you that slide, uh, that you have antibody goes up, comes down, but then it becomes stable. So this is that stable phase. And this beautiful study that Mark Slifka published from uh, his lab in NEJM, had done a very similar study, not looking at these, but looking at childhood vaccines given 40 or 50 years earlier in some cases, and they were all flat lines. And we and uh, Shane Crotty have also shown uh, things along those lines. Then we find the same thing with the human alpha coronaviruses and with the beta coronavirus. Of course, there was no, these people did not have SARS-CoV-2, who go one and And of course, they don't have SARS-CoV-2. But this is again showing how slow or no decline of antibody in these, uh, for these. So childhood infection, now very stable number. Also, I wouldn't go too far, not too many bumps, but we could have missed some bumps. Okay? The question comes, how often are they getting reinfected? If they are, at least in this cohort with this thing, uh, if they were reinfected, it not result in a big bump. But again, that's a soft statement because we have not done that that yet. But again, the data here is clear, Fantastic stability of the center that response. And again, presumably, or most likely coming from the long Okay, so what happens to these responses when people get SARS CoV 2 infection? So now we switch to the blue lines here now are, is our cohort that got SARS CoV 2 infection. Okay? And this is the timeline for the SARS CoV 2 infection. Okay? You see that there's really no change in the antibody to the alpha, the two alpha virus, straight lines in this entire period, and also very similar flat curve, if any, no decline can be calculated. In this case, but it's over 1,000 days, essentially, no decline to the alpha. But with the beta, we see a little bit, because there's some cross reactivity. So what you see now is a little bit higher. So if you see that this red line, this is the pre-pandemic, these are the people who got infected now, See their antibody titers to HTU1, which is a beta is slightly higher. And the most obvious increase is actually in the OC43. So there is some cross reactivity uh, between the antibodies induced by the um, SARS CoV 2 with the two beta. And of course, the other interesting thing is that now when you make this antibody, you will get a decline because many of these are those plasma blasts that were induced by the SARS CoV 2 infection, and of course they will die, so you have that again, that, uh, that decay there. SARS CoV 1, actually, as many people have shown, there is a significant increase, so there was nothing there in these individuals, and you get really a very nice uh, Whether this has biological relevance, we don't know, but certainly there is a significant increase in SARS CoV 1. And this has been shown by many people. In fact, some of the monoclonals uh, that were actually generated, I think, uh, it's a monoclonal that uh, Lanzavecchia generated from SARS CoV 1 infection is actually quite good neutralizing SARS CoV 2, at least the Wuhan strain. Uh, uh, so, you certainly, that cross reactivity part has been well documented. But here it is the point I want to make is the, is the longevity issue. Okay, what about neutralization? I go back now to neutralizing antibody. Again, this has similar, is this is noisy because the, there is a cutoff fairly quickly of the neutralizing ones because they drop off, but still you can see that where we can, in many of these, we clearly see neutralizing antibody out to 18 months, in, uh, sorry, out to eight months. And again, the half-life calculation are very similar. Again, the 
the power law is more consistent with the slope that we see here. Uh, what about correlation between binding and that? Very well. Many, many people have shown this, that the neutralizing antibody responses correlate nicely with the binding antibody. Of course, the proportion is low, but there is good correlation with binding and um, neutralizing antibody for the spike and also for the plasma. What about memory D cell? This was interesting. So with the T cells go up and down, as you see, I'll show you in a, in a while. Antibody goes up and down, but memory D cell, interestingly, continue to increase for several weeks or several months. And Shane Crotty and Alex Seti actually published a very nice paper in Science. It came out actually before our paper and made a very similar observation. That is, memory D cell continue to increase for several months. Actually, when Shane first showed me that data, I was a little skeptical, but uh, they were absolutely right. It, it is, and this is probably reflecting the sustained generation of memory B cells from the germinal centers after that. You know, so, but it does plateau off a little bit over here. But you can see that for the first uh, um, two to three months, there is an increase in the number of memory cells, and then recently plateau. This is the CD4 uh, T cell data. Okay. Um, and again, you know, this is a reasonable half-life, about 200 days or so. But, but again, it's more up and down. Uh, and if you look at the phenotype of these cells, putting them into the classical central memory, effective memory, majority of these have the central memory phenotype. And functionality is very good. These are very polyfunctional cells uh, uh, and have the, the classical TH1 uh, thing. Again, many, many wonderful papers have come out showing the same the same observation. But the point again I want to make is the longevity of these cells and their high uh, Same thing with CD8 responses. Uh, very good. One interesting thing that we observe, and this has also been shown by other people, in most systemic viral infections, CD8 responses are always higher than CD4 responses in the magnitude. But in the SARS CoV 2 infected individuals, we're dealing here with the five pre infection. There's more actually, and we're measuring only the blood, that's the caveat, but the CD4 responses tend to be slightly higher than the CD8. And Shane Crotty and Alex Setti and others have found the same thing. And many other people have done this. The interesting, I have, don't have an answer for it, but most systemic infections we've looked at, yellow fever, dengue, many others, uh, CD8 responses are almost always higher than CD4. But in this observation, in these studies, it seems to be slightly lower. And in the case of the phenotype here, what ends up uh, becoming more dominant over time is the Stemra phenotype. But as we showed in the yellow fever study uh, that we published a while back, these really are uh, the really the most functional cells. And like uh, the assumption in the literature that these are less functional, this actually is the best. It keeps increasing over time, and these will become the long-lived uh, memory sequence. And again, these are highly, highly functional cells. They make multiple cytokines, uh, including for gamma, they have uh, granzyme depurpurin. And so essentially you're getting highly functional memory CD4 and CD8 T cell. One really interesting observation was this. So when we look at the, and I really want to drill this point home because I think it's an important thing that has uh, not been appreciated. If you look at the, so in these studies, uh, uh, we look not just at spike, I should have mentioned that before. We're looking at multiple open region strains. Okay? So the antibody analysis focused on the spike protein, but the T cell analysis uh, uh, was looking at multiple open region strains. Right? That is, we had peptides for the spike, for the envelope, for the matrix, for the nucleic acid, and several of the open region strains. So we're looking at much broadly at many different regions. So what we found was that if you look at the distribution of the CD4 T cell response, it's there everywhere. That is, there are CD4 T cells recognizing peptides from the, uh, the spike region, as which would be broken into two, two, two parts, to the envelope, to the matrix, to the nucleic acid, pretty good distri e e equivalent distribution. But when we come to the CD8 responses, there is this clear and striking bias towards CD8 responses being directed to the nucleic acid protein. And you have to ask the question, why is that? It's not because the epitopes are not there. If you just do your standard epitope uh, identification um, 
exercise, uh, there's no bias for more epitope being in the nephropod. That's right there for everything. But our explanation for this, uh, not so much data from here, but from studies we have done more in the FCMB model and other studies, is that the infected cell, which would be a major mechanism for activating, stimulating, and expanding the T cell response, especially the CD T cells, okay, that those cells have more nucleic acid derived peptides on the infected cell. This is a key point because what it tells us is that to eliminate a virally infected cell, the nucleic acid uh, specific cells will be an important player in that. And this is not unique just for uh, SARS-CoV-2. This is very well established in many infections, human infections in particular, especially where it's very striking is with the flavi virus, where there's a real bias towards CD8 responses being directed to the non-structural protein. Uh, in this case, we're seeing this bias to the nucleic acid protein. I think this has this is due to a combination of the concentration of the protein inside the cell and processing uh, uh, processing machinery and presentation. Okay. So, so we would strongly recommend that uh, one should include the nucleic acid protein or the nucleic acid gene in the case of the RNA vaccines and the ad-based vaccines into uh, as part of the uh, in, into the vaccine. This will greatly broaden uh, the CD8 T cell response and generate T cells that will very nicely target infected cells. And the CD8 response becomes particularly important when we are dealing with, for example, cancer patients who have B cell malignancy. In studies that we have done in collaboration with Mahdi Bhokta, uh, looking at uh, multiple myeloma patients and looking in lymphoma patients, the study was led by Andres Chang, who was a fellow in my lab. He's uh, now in the faculty at the Venture Cancer Center. Uh, we found that there was a, there's a real problem, not surprisingly, because the treatments deplete the T cells. Treatment for lymphoma is anti-CD20 antibody, and that, of course, depletes the T cell. And what uh, Andres found, and there are other groups which have shown the same thing, is that lymphoma patients respond very poorly to the vaccine, especially if they are within a one-year window of getting anti-CD20 treatment. Rituximab. That is, if they are beyond one year, then they make a reasonable response. But if they're less than a year, make very poor responses because the B cells have not come back. The situation with multiple myeloma is even worse because there, the treatment is anti-CD38 antibody, which is depleting the plasma cell. Both the plasma blast express high level CD38 and the long blood plasma cell express that. So there, the responses are even worse. If you're getting CD38 antibody treatment, which is the treatment for multiple myeloma, the antibody really is gone. So I think in these cases, one really needs a good CD8 T cell response uh, as a backup. These people now get IVIG or they get uh, uh, passive infusion with antibodies. Those are all very good. But it would be really key for especially the specialized population to have the nucleic acid as within the vaccine uh, and also to have vaccines that would generate good CD8 T cell response. This nucleic acid inclusion will be beneficial for everyone, but in particular, for these uh, uh, immunocompromised individuals, especially people with uh, B cell malignancy. Okay, so this, let me summarize this part. So what I've shown you is that, um, uh, that there is good durability uh, for IgG responses, uh, you know, for the neutralizing antibody memory B cells, polyphone CD4 cells and CD8 T cells. Now that study that I showed you was out to eight months after the infection. Uh, most of these individuals now have been, we're still following them, and we hope to continue to follow them for longer, ask additional questions. Most of them now have been vaccinated, but some still did not get the vaccine for reasons, uh, basically, they made that decision. Uh, and so we can follow now, we've now followed out to about uh, 18 months. And now you see that the response, I've shown you here data in this window, out to to 40 or 50. Now we have them, some of them going out to 540 without any vaccine. Now you see it's really flattening out. So this is kind of now resembling what I showed you for the childhood vaccine infections with the coronavirus, okay, becoming very flat. Okay. So I think that this infection has certainly been quite efficient in generating a pool of long-lived uh, 
plasma cells, which will at least produce some antibody that will come out into the into the circulation. And memory B cell numbers also are remaining quite flat in the end. Okay, so this is the conclusion from this very broad and balanced immune memory, not only to the spike protein, but also T cell responses to multiple other uh, uh, multiple other proteins in the in the virus, and in particular this means the gamma protein. What about the activity to SARS-CoV-2 variant? So well, this has been studied extensively by many, many groups who have done very, very elegant and nice study. And the bottom line here is, as we found and many others have found before us, is that the activity to the, this is data from our convalescent uh, cohort, I think this was like about six months to six months, beyond six months uh, time point. Of course, they have good binding antibody to the Wuhan or the ancestral strain that they got infected with. Not bad uh, binding antibody to Delta, a little bit lower, maybe two to three fold lower, but not much. Omicron, a little bit lower still, some binding, but uh, but significantly lower. I should point out that the difference between the spike protein of uh, of the Wuhan or WA1 strain and Omicron is only about 3%. So 97% of about 50 plus amino acid changes, but they're in T regions in the neutralizing uh, part, the RBT. And so th that's the bad part. But overall, over 97% homology. Uh, so, the, so when you do binding antibody, you can pick up uh, a reasonable uh, signal. But if you look at neutralizing antibody, then again, it really falls to the uh, it, you know, really just very, very low. And has, this has been shown by many people. So what uh, the conclusion is that if you, uh, sorry, that the people who got the natural infection uh, have good antibody to the Wuhan and Delta, but very low uh, to the to Omicron. Uh, again, many people have shown this. What happens after if these people get a, a vaccine? And that data is shown here. Again, this is data that's been shown by multiple people. We are not the, certainly not the first person people to do this, but it makes the it, it, the key point here. Of course, the, the getting a vaccine and they were previously infected uh, helps, increases very nice. The, I'm just showing you the neutralizing antibody data. You get an increase in neutralizing antibody to Wuhan, also to Delta, less to Omicron, but that also increases. But again, it goes down. If you look uh, later, it goes down. One question that we haven't addressed carefully in our study, but we will be focusing on it now, is really a critical analysis of the decline uh, after natural infection versus after vaccination. Uh, a lot of people have published data, but it put if side by side comparison, same assays is still kind of lacking. They're trying to kind of get the right set of samples to do that. But what we're beginning to do now is the decline kinetics after vaccination of the previous infected. And then also it seems to be a little bit faster than the natural infection. So something to keep in mind and uh, for us and others to look at in more detail. So the, the conclusion from this is that Wuhan infection uh, is, uh, even though you get it, it kind of goes down uh, fairly quickly. So now I'll share with you some unpublished data, at least from our lab, um, or our group, uh, looking at what happens after infection with Delta or Omicron. So this is Wuhan infection vaccination, responses to Omicron low, but what if you got infected with Delta? Or most of all, what if you got infected with Omicron? How does that profile look like? So we were very fortunate to enter a collaboration with the CDC uh, and, uh, and Vanderbilt. So this is a very large uh, epidemiological study that uh, CDC and Vanderbilt are doing. They have uh, looking at hospitalized patients in the last, uh, in the last two years. Uh, so these are our hospitalized patients uh, from the last two years. Okay. And uh, they have about 5,000 samples, uh, and they've given us uh, 500 samples uh, where they have PBMC as well as seven. And I'm showing you to show you data today about 187 of these people looking at neutralizing antibody response. So what uh, we have is, uh, what I show you data on is 187 hospitalized COVID-19 patients. 61 of these were infected with Delta. Uh, and out of the ones that I've analyzed so, so far, I show you data, 44 were unvaccinated, 17 were vaccinated. An interesting uh, statistic with the Delta infection, and this has been reported very extensively by others, is that the majority of the people who got 
Delta infection and became sick, but actually unvaccinated. The proportion of vaccinated people who ended up in the hospital was quite low. In fact, we have to kind of, because we wanted to compare <laughs> unvaccinated, we had to look hard to find how many were actually uh, unvaccinated versus most were unvaccinated. But we did, for this initial analysis, include 17 that were vaccinated. Uh, and then we have 126 Omicron infected patients. Uh, here, the vast majority actually were vaccinated. Because also, I think there are fewer unvaccinated people, but the vaccine really has not been that effective in preventing infection and even uh, symptomatic infection. I guess, so here's 36 unvaccinated and 19 uh, vaccinated. Okay. So, in this slide, I'm showing you the slide is busy, but the take home message is very easy. Ignore all the statistics because you don't need statistics because the data is so clear. Okay. So, this is SIRA from 44. Uh, hospitalized patients. All the data was collected in the first few weeks or the early time. So we don't have longer time points while they were still in the hospital or just immediately after leaving. And we looked at neutralization against the WA strain, Delta, the ancestral one, Delta, GA1, GA2. And you see a striking dominance of the infecting strain in these live individuals. Not surprising. That's what uh, immunology is. They will respond to what's infecting them. So very good neutralization of Delta, reasonably good of Wuhan, but very poor of both VA1 and VA2. Significant drop. If you now go to the 17 vaccinated individuals, now you find that Wuhan and Delta are very equivalent. Not surprising because they had a lot of Wuhan specific memory B cells. Many of those would have been recruited, and so you get by Delta. So you're getting equivalent over here, but again, low for VA1, VA2. So what this is telling us is that in Delta infected people, whether they were naive or vaccinated, it was Delta dominant in the in both cases, Delta who are similar in vaccinated, but poor to own. Now what I'll show you in the next slide, and you immediately recognize a very different pattern is Omicron infected patients. Here, instead of this clear pattern, it's messy, but you see very different patterns. That is now the response is much more balanced. You're clearly getting responses to VA1, VA2. I should point out that these uh, patients were collected pre ba 5 So they were infected either with VA1 or VA2. In fact, majority of them are infected with VA1. In over 50% of the cases, we have confirmed sequence, and the other 50% is from that same season. The most likely VA1, VA2, and we really see no difference between confirmed versus the from based on the season. But strikingly different pattern as compared to what we saw here, and compared to what I showed you earlier with the Wuhan infection of the positive Wuhan vaccine. And the same pattern is seen in unvaccinated and even the vaccinated. You again see a little bit higher for the ancestral strain here compared to here. But again, you know, it's not. It's pretty good to VA1, VA2. Another way of looking at this is the ratio. So this is the same data shown in a different way. And what I plotted here is VA1 ratio over antibody to the Wuhan strain. Okay. So in the Delta infection in unvaccinated, very low antibody to the VA1. That's why this is like 0.1 to 0.01. But unvaccinated Omicron, very different. Now you have a lot of antibody to, uh, uh, to, the, to the VA1. Uh, strain. Uh, and even in the vaccinated, you still see that the Omicron to BA1 ratio is much better in after Omicron infection compared to the Delta. What about BA5, which is the currently circulating strain? So the data is interesting. So all of these do neutralize BA5, unlike what we saw with the Delta or the Wuhan, but it's lower. You can see that they're better for BA1, BA2. BA5 is a bit lower. Not bad. I mean, it's uh, at least better than what it was with, uh, but not ideal, but it is uh, lower to BA5. So here are the conclusions from the study. So Omicron infection induces a more balanced and proportional neutralizing antibody response to SARS-CoV-2 variants. Uh, BA1, BA2 infection elicits measurable but significantly lower neutralizing cycle to BA5 compared to BA1 and BA2. And then I think that a sensible conclusion from it, from these studies, is that uh, the inclusion 
uh, it would be good to include the Omicron BA5 in a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. But I, but, and as I show in the next slide, that exactly is the recommendation of FDA uh, to include BA5 in the vaccine. But the question I want to bring up is, but these were the data I showed you where you're getting a nice Omicron response are really from infected people. And they were infected enough to be in the hospital. So a lot of antigen was there driving the response. And can we actually reproduce that in the context of vaccination? And I think uh, there will be some, certainly we should change to be a five, uh, but I think um, there will be some challenges in terms of how the immunization is done. And I want to kind of uh, end on that point and then some comments about uh, protection, infection of the disease. So the FDA has recently recommended that the Omicron BA5 should be added to uh, the Wuhan strain and used as a booster shot. The recommendation is a 50-50 mix of BA5 uh, with WA1. And the estimate is that sometime in the fall or by the end of the year, uh, we will have the vaccine. Interestingly, the UK just announced a decision uh, a few weeks back uh, saying that they actually are going to use BA1. I don't know why they want to use BA1, but that's the decision. So UK is moving. In the UK, there will be a combination vaccine with BA1 and WA1. So the question is, if you give a single shot of uh, this mixed vaccine, I mean, how much of an Omicron response would you get? I think it's better than not having BA5 there, even a single shot. But perhaps one might need two shots to get enough of a response. In particular, if you want to try and recruit into the response naive B cells which are Omicron specific, uh, that will require a single shot is not going to uh, be, be enough. And uh, I'm going to come back to this. I'm going to go to the next slide to make a point. And we kind of ha had a study done with influenza, which kind of demonstrated this principle very nicely. So this was a study that Ali did when he was uh, at Emory. And it was a study uh, looking at vaccination of healthy young adults, all human studies, uh, with an adjuvanted H5N1 vaccine. So this was H5N1 uh, plus ASO3. And we had uh, two groups, one that got the H5N1 adjuvanted with ASO3, other non-adjuvanted, the non-adjuvanted was a lousy uh, uh, response. Adjuvanted was a very good response. The regimen was too short day zero and at day 21. What Ali found was that after the first shot, there was in the, the group that got the adjuvanted H5N1 vaccine made a beautiful plasma blast response, very high antibody, but almost all of that was specific for the stem region of the HA uh, and was derived from memory B cells. The monoclonal antibodies made uh, by Ali looking at that were all heavily mutated and they were highly cost reactive. So the H5N1 uh, HA, the stem region, uh, recruited the pre-existing memory B cells and got this fantastic plasma blast response and antibody response uh, after the first shot. There was hardly any antibody to the head region of H5N1, which is the unique part after the first shot. But after the second shot, you now clearly got plasma blasts that are specific for the head. And all of those came from naive B cells. So what that tells us is that if you want to recruit any naive B cells, one shot is not going to be enough with the H5. Uh, and really how one plays with this, how one do, does this will be not that easy in the context of vaccinating large number of people. But from an immunological point of view, a single shot may not be up uh, with this. And then the other point, uh, but again, I would emphasize, single shot is better than no shot with the five. I would, I would recommend taking it even if the single shot is better. But I think to really get more optimal, you might need more than one. And then the other question that we should consider is that why are we retaining? Is it necessary to retain WA1 in the updated vaccine? And um, you can make all kinds of arguments, but I think the common sense argument, the simple one is perhaps you don't need it. Because there is a downside to including WA1, and the downside is that the dose of BA5 actually gets reduced because you cannot increase, you can't double the dose of the mRNA vaccine because of the side effects. So now 
you end up reducing the risk. So I think these are things for us to consider and for the FDA to consider, and of course, for the pharmaceutical companies to consider really how do we, as we change, as we're changing the vaccine, how then do we use it? But immunization strategies really to optimize what we're trying to get. And what we're trying to get here is better antibodies to be applied. All right, let me now end on this slide is the issue of protection from infection versus protection from disease. This is a question that uh, vaccinologists and people interested in these areas have been addressing and discussing for a long time. I should also point out that vaccines really have been desi were designed for individual protection. So we take a vaccine to protect ourselves. But from a public health perspective, you also want to protect other people. So here, it, the issue becomes that if you don't protect from infection, then you can still transmit. So from a public health perspective, protection from infection becomes very critical. From an individual perspective, if you get a very mild disease or get very minimal uh, symptoms, not a bad deal, because that's what most vaccines do. They will prevent you from getting disease. There's a very interesting debate that uh, will continue, you know, and I think um, there's no clear answer, but I think one needs to think that protection infection becomes critical, as I said, in the context of transmission uh, and public health thing. But if a vaccine is protecting from disease or severe disease, it's a successful vaccine. One could make that argument. And then I want to end on what is perhaps the most um, interesting issue to discuss and often is uh, ignored. And that is protection from mucosal versus systemic infection slash disease. So we assume that when we're dealing with something like measles or yellow fever, uh, where you're getting this protection from disease for decades, if not longer, that we are also getting protection from infection. We have no data on that. We, only, we have data on disease. Because if you get infected with yellow fever or with measles, and there's some subclinical infection, some infection, there's no clinical symptoms. Clinical symptoms only happen after spread. So it's the spread that's critical in giving disease and not initial infection. But when you come to mucosal, infection, where infection of the respiratory tract, even if it's not that great, can result in symptoms. So this issue of, sometimes people say, well, why can't we get something like measles or yellow fever because we don't get it, or smallpox. But the reality is we have no data there that there isn't a subclinical infection that we never see because there are no symptoms. So I think some of these issues need to be looked at in more detail and probably a better message to the public, what vaccines do, and what they don't do. Um, one view would be that really it's very difficult to prevent initial infection. This concept of sterilizing immunity may not be that easy to achieve. So I think this the information public is key here because it, just because there's some infection and some mild symptoms which would happen in the case of a mucosal or respiratory infection or infection of the other mucosal site, you know, it's still a success for the vaccine because it's going to prevent severe disease. Uh, and certainly is a success if they say it's systemic infection. So with that, let me end. Uh, but these are issues where uh, there are no clear answers. That are issues that need to be discussed and studied in more detail and more nuanced uh, messages given, not only to the general public, but even to the scientists. Because I think sometimes there's confusion in terms of what is, uh, what when is a vaccine working, when it's not working. So let me end here by the most important slide, which is the people who did this work. So the Linderman really was, uh, key person, Susie is a research associate in the lab and is really the, the lead person for the our SARS-CoV-2 studies. Andres Chang uh, has done the lymphoma uh, studies, which I didn't show, but I kind of uh, mentioned. And then many other people in the lab, Don, Rajesh, Moni, and Sal have contributed to this. This has been a very close collaboration with Mayhul Sutter's lab and his and I. All the neutralization data I showed you actually were done by in Mayhul's lab. Uh, also very close collaboration with the Antibiotics Lab, and many of the research studies that showed you were done uh, jointly by Jens in our lab. Okay. Uh, would acknowledge the clinicians at uh, Emory, Shri, uh, Shivan Patel, and 
Estaba, who are at the Hope Clinic of the Emily Vaccine Center. And again, they are the key people who enrolled uh, this cohort that we have. Evan Anderson from Pediatrics and our Rustam Barani and Hassan who have tested this patient. It's really nice, this biphasic uh, curve that we uh, the credit for that goes, goes to them. And as I said, very close collaboration with Judy McElrath's group. We have the other 50% of the cohort. Interestingly, most of the T cell data I showed you actually comes from Judy's lab. Okay. Uh, interesting that we didn't do too much T cell studies in this study, but most of that data is from Judy's lab. And then the IV study, that very nice study we're doing with uh, the infected patient. And we hope to continue to get more samples. Uh, we will be getting samples from DA5. So I'd be very excited about now seeing what DA5 is giving uh, if you get infected, what kind of responses. And so we have this nice collaboration with Vanderbilt. Best Self is the clinician leading the study. And CDC is the funder for this, and Manish Patel is our main contact there. And again, special thanks to the patients. Thank you very much. And I may have gone a little bit over, so I apologize. Uh, thank you, Rafi. That was really a great guide. And I think thank you for all your practical advice and the implications of it all and how you're guiding a lot of the decisions that are happening with the pandemic. So we really appreciate all your all your influence and input. Um, as always, uh, we would like people to be able to ask Rafi questions via Twitter. So go ahead and go to the Global Immuno Talks. And, and that's where you can find a, a tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Rafi Ahmed here. And then, and then we will ensure that he replies to his tweets. Believe it or not, Rafi just posted a Twitter account so he now at the Rafi on Med Lab has a Twitter account. <laughs> Don't know how that happened, but it happened. Um, we're really, um, again, Rafi, thank you so much for uh, joining so us. I must, I must say that I have nothing to do with that account that went up. Hidden kissing is responsible for it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and do you know what? Do you know what I have? He said managed by the Ahmed Lab. So I'm resolved with anything that, so I'm not responsible for anything that comes on that Twitter. But I'll be do happy you, to answer your question. Do, do you know what a hashtag is? No, of course I don't. <laughs> so please add hashtag global and we know uh, so that other people can see it as well. Thank you so much, Rafi. I'm going to stop recording. You, you volunteered, you, Alina, volunteered to send me these slides. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll reply. All right. Thanks, thanks again. Bye -bye. Thank you.